What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of our Hospitality MD podcast interview series presented right here on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Before we get started with today's guest, subscribe to our channel, turn on notifications, give us a thumbs up, and be ready to share this video with anybody you think would like it. Our guest today is Adam Knight. He is the principal of Knowing Hospitality, which is a full-service hotel management and consulting company. He also hosts a great hospitality podcast called Proven Principles. If you like Hospitality MD, you will enjoy Proven Principles, so please give them a listen and support hospitalitarians who are doing their part to give back to people just like me and you. Today, we are going to be talking about Adam's experience coming up in executive committee and general manager roles in with iconic hotel brands such as Fairmont and St. Regis. He's achieved tremendous success in his career, but the question is, at what cost did that success come from? And despite the cost, why he continues to love the hotel industry with every fiber of his being, so much so that after he got let go from his recent job as a result of the pandemic, he's decided to make his career in hospitality a choice that he continues uh, despite his circumstances. So this is the cost of hotel management career. This is Adam Knight. This is Hospitality MD. Enjoy the video. Thanks for being on Hospitality MD. I really appreciate it. Um, this question I ask a lot of, well, actually pretty much all of our interviewees, which is, do you remember the first time you felt hospitality? Could be digging deep, going back to childhood, like that enunciation moment is what I'm looking for. Hmm, that is an interesting question. Uh, you know, I remember my first job in the field. Uh, and it's not the first, like at my first official hotel job, I was a pot washer, but long before that, my mother owned a coffee shop in my hometown of Edmonton, Alberta in Canada. Uh, and she hired me to, to clean tables and wash dishes for whatever the minimum wage was back then, four bucks an hour <laughs> for, a, but you know, for like a 15 year old, that's, that's, you know, you'd struck gold. Uh, and so, you know, Saturdays I would go and, and, and work in the coffee shop and it was my first real time of not only like figuring out what work was in responsibility and, and, and whatnot, but being in front of customers and working with other people who, you know, up until that point, I mean, you're 14, 15, who do, who do you interact with other than your friends of the same age, your parents and probably their parents. So you're never with like. 20 somethings or 30 somethings, uh, and who aren't in a position of authority with you. So, you know, you're kind of on this funny peer level with other people that are kind of doing the same work that you're doing. And that, I do remember that that opened my eyes a little bit to, there's a lot more out here. Uh, and, but, but I hated the job at the same time, because who wants to be cleaning people's dirty dishes when you're that age and you know, you're on your feet for eight, nine, 10 hours. And there's a bunch of side work that you have to do. So you kind of think you're going to go in and you're going to do one job, but then there's 15 other things that you have to do to make sure that the business is still running properly. And I mean, at that point, and your mom's your boss too, and my right? mom is my boss. <laughs> and it's just, you know, I, I, uh, I learned a lot in that job. Um, I, but it takes a little bit of reflecting to realize really what, I got out of it because you could totally make the case that that set the path for me in my career going forward. I just didn't know it at the time. Interesting. So, yeah, so this was, and if you haven't read the book, I'll recommend it. Second Mountain by David Brooks. I don't know if I think maybe I already told you about that book, but 
if I haven't, that's the book. And it talks about these enunciation moments are typically, you don't know it at the time, but eventually you might be able to look back and you can trace it back to that moment um, in, in the future, right? So maybe at the time, 15 years old, you hated it, but something clicked somewhere subconsciously maybe. Yeah, interesting you say that. I mean, yeah, because I, I realized that, you know, I, I just said I hated the job and then 25 years later, here I am still in the industry. But it was more about like, I think when you're that age, you just, it's more than you don't know what you don't know. It's like, you just don't really have this, the scope, the frame, the perspective to really understand everything that's going on around you and, and how much bigger the world is than you've had exposure to at that point. And I just think that that disconnects in, in your brain, cause you just can't see what's in front of you. Um, is, it's absolutely a real thing. And, and it, yes, the benefit of age and time, you can look back on these experiences. Um, but you're a hundred percent right. There was something that probably really spoke to me in that experience that kept me going in this industry, um, for all these years. And, um, you know, and I think one of the things that that is, was the exposure to so many other people and so many other ways of looking at things and, and interacting with interesting people with great stories and, and, quite frankly, not the guests, the employees. Working with people from different walks of life and, and having different points of view and conversations, I think that grabbed me. And that's yeah. what carried me through, at least in the early days of my career. Yeah. And I will say, like, I think I could probably agree with you on that. I started my first hotel job when I was 17. And you go into the hotel and it's just every race, every ethnicity, every possible conglomeration of human being is working at the hotel with the common goal of taking care of the guests. So like before you even start talking about all the interesting guests you meet, it's like you go to the cafeteria for lunch and you sit down and how many different languages are you hearing being spoken in the, in yeah. the cafeteria? How many different perspectives and viewpoints and ages and positions and everything? And it's just like, talk about just... <laughs> like cu culture shock almost happening all at once, you know, for, because it's just that scope that you mentioned when you have, when you're young, you don't know until you know. Um, mm -hmm. And I know tells a damn good way to find out. A hundred percent. I remember the first conversation that I had with, with a coworker from another country that uh, when he told me his story of getting into the country um, and what it took for him to like get out of his home country and a lot of the issues that they were dealing with and, and, and kind of the long arduous journey of getting to kind of where the point where we were sitting in the cafeteria, having a conversation was unbelievable. And, and that totally changed my perspective on things. Cause I, again, up until that point, I'd either, you know, not either interacted with people that had a story like that or, you know, I just didn't ask the right questions and, and, you know, call that whatever you want. Uh, but, you know, again, that was one of those things that, that uh, connected me to the industry and it still does. And that's probably, you know, where the podcast came from ultimately. And, you know, there's, you could probably draw a lot of threads or pull a lot of threads through everything that I'm talking about, how it's sort of culminated in what I'm doing today. And that's just, that's just the beauty of it. And another part of it is too, is like, you didn't ignore it. You actually, because how many people ignore those things and then end up unhappy because they're doing something that they think they should be doing when it's not actually what they want to be doing. So mm -hmm. I think it's great that we can connect these threads together because that means you actually did what you wanted to do, at least is what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. um, Ultimately. Yeah. So first hotel you were 15 at the coffee shop first hotel where are you how old are you what are you doing 17 uh i was a pot washer uh right out of high school at a ski resort in the canadian rockies um and it was uh it was the it's the jasper park lodge um formerly canadian pacific now branded fairmont um but we, we can go into that history if you want, but, but it's basically, you know, it's a Fairmont hotel now. Um, and it was a place that we stayed at a lot growing up as a kid, uh, cause it's three hours from 
you know, where we grew up. And the one thing I knew for sure go, coming out of high school is that I didn't want to go to college. I didn't want to go to university. Uh, I just wanted to get out and work and experience things. And for some reason at 17, uh, my parents were okay with me <laughs> getting a, a, a job three hours away from home. Uh, I was too young to get into staff accommodation. You had to be 18 to get in. Mm. Uh, and so my, uh, my parents had to co-sign a lease for me in the town of Jasper. Uh, and so here I am, 17 years old, living in a studio apartment in a ski resort. Um, and I, I remember like how this, I don't even know, my head was kind of spinning at one point. How did I literally just go from living in the basement to having my own apartment? I just finished high school. I can't even drink yet. Drinking age up there is 18. Can't even drink yet. Uh, and here I am living on my own and, you know, going to work had the, uh, you know, the best shift of all 7 PM to 3 AM <laughs> washing, washing big steam kettles. Like that, they were so big, you had to get in them to clean them. Um, cause this is a big, you know, I don't remember how many rooms, but you know, call it 400 room resort, several restaurants, golf course. I mean, it's, it's kind of a, the quintessential Fairmont resort that you think about. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it was, uh, an incredible experience. So, yeah, I mean, talk about going on your own and just jumping right into the, the grind, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. and honestly, I mean, not to take anything away from, from, you know, going to college and whatever, like it's totally cool and everything, but you go to college and you get your class schedule and everything's cool and you go there and you get your dorm room and they make the food for you and everything is good but it's just like nope 7 a.m to there's 7 p.m to 3 a.m wash these giant pots go back to your studio apartment with nothing figure out survive on your own just get it done um but i find it interesting that you ended up at that resort that you used to stay at with your parents as well yeah. uh and your family like Take me back to staying there, the feeling that you got staying there, and then juxtap uh, juxtaposed to the feeling of you working there and getting that job. There was something that fascinated me, I think, when we were staying there about how something like that can run. How do you bring all of this together and to, to have these put these great experiences together. How do you maintain all these buildings? And and the resort is like, it's a whole bunch of cabins all over. Like, I don't know how many acres it is, but it's, you know, probably many hundred acres big. Uh, and, and so, you know, you, you weren't staying in this one tower, you were sort of out on the property and you interacted with you know, different elements of the property when you stayed there. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what it was that got me or had me want to apply for a job there. And quite frankly, like I had zero experience other than working in the coffee shop and like I had a paper route and whatever, but you know, the only job I was really qualified to do was the job that I got hired to do. Um, and you know, I think there was a combination of wanting to move away and experience things. Uh, I had zero intention of staying in hospitality at that point. Uh, it was just, an opportunity to move to a ski resort, get a free ski pass, probably was going to do it for a season and then move back and figure out what I was going to do with my life, which at the time was either getting into banking and finance, or I was exploring the opportunity or the option of going to law school, which ultimately, I mean, you have to go through a lot of steps, right. To, to do that. But those were the two paths that I was looking at. Uh, and, you know, after my time in Jasper wrapped up, I moved over, I moved back to Edmonton, uh, still didn't know what I wanted to do, but I moved back without a job and needed to get a job. And I had some hotel experience at this point. So I just started firing off resumes at hotels downtown in Edmonton Trap, and got, man. that was it. And then I got <laughs> hired as a, as a bellman at a, a downtown hotel there. And that's, probably when things really started to take off, I had that job, I think it was three years, maybe four years. Uh, it was the, to this day, the most fun job I've ever had. Hands down. Uh, and then, you know, and then I, I had an opportunity to, to get promoted to, to the front desk. Um, 
And, and so I had got some front desk experience. And so at this point, they're like three or four years deep in the industry. And I'm 22, 21 or 22 at the time. And uh, we figured I should probably go to school at this point. I'm like, okay, you can't, you should get some post-secondary. This is a conversation I had with my parents at the time. And, uh, and so I applied for a hotel management program uh, in Victoria, British Columbia, got accepted. Uh, so I moved out to the coast. Uh, a year later, started the program. So I was 23 when I started the job, or start, sorry, started the program, but I was working at a Fairmont hotel in Victoria, the Empress at the time. And it wasn't Fairmont, it was Canadian Pacific, but you know, for continuity sake. Uh, and I was working on the front desk there too. And I, I, uh, was in this hotel program. I was the old man in the program at 23. Cause there was a bunch of kids out of high school that went, everybody in. would have already graduated by that age, you but know? like if, they would have finished you, their four year at that. They would have been going on to like, you know, a master's program at that point, but here I am in this program and, uh, working the front desk at the Empress and like, this is, this is what I guess, I guess this is what I'm going to do with my life right now. And, and so that, that kind of took me through through my early twenties, finishing school. And then I remember when I finished the program, uh, I, I reached out to, uh, the, the then GM at the Fairmont in Calgary and, uh, said, Hey, you know, he was a director of operations at the Empress when I was there. And I said, Hey, I just finished this hotel program. I'm thinking about moving to Calgary. That's where a lot of my friends had moved to from Edmonton. It's only a three hour drive South. And, uh, do you have any positions available? Like how, how bold is that? I mean, 25 at, at this point and directly emailing a GM who I, <laughs> who I like, I don't really know. Like I'm hoping he remembers my name because I was on the front desk. I certainly know his name. Uh, and then he says, yeah, he, he emails me back. He says, uh, these are the positions we have available. What do you want to do? Uh, and they had something on their private concierge floor um, the, the, called Fairmont Gold. It was called Entree Gold at the time. And uh, I, I said, I'll, I'll do that job because it sounds like front desk. And I, I wanted to kind of elevate my skill set a little bit, dealing with a higher end clientele. So let's, so let's do that. So he put me in touch with the Fairmont Gold manager. Uh, I had an interview, uh, got the job like a, a week later. Uh, and on when I wrote my last final, uh, the very, very last test, my the very last final, I drove to school. My car was packed. The apartment was empty. Uh, I wrote the test in the morning, finished up at like 10 or 1030 in the morning. And then I drove 12 hours straight to Calgary and I started that job on Monday. Uh, and that, you know, again, that's things kind of continue to escalate from there. That's just the grit, man, the grit and the trap of hotels as well. It's just like, not that you were trapped because you, you know, that it was the only option that you had at the time, but it's just, I love how this industry is one thing always leads to another. And it's mm -hmm. usually not even the, your fault. It just happens that way. Except in the case of you emailing the GM, definitely bold at the time. You're like, look at me, I got my degree. Now can I do something with you? <laughs> <laughs> you can see him like, who's this guy? Like, who does this guy think he is? But he was, he, but you know, he was, this is, he's one of those managers. And we talk about this a lot now that servant leadership and level five leadership, if you're into good grades and, you know, whatever you want to call it. But he, he was, I think he, he understood the value of cultivating uh, yeah, interest from young people coming into the industry and, and saw the value that people could bring in. And this is, I'm 43 now. So this is like almost 20 years ago. Uh, and, and for someone to, uh, to really kind of go against the grain, when you think about conventional corporate culture, especially back then, right. uh, that's, that stuck with me, uh, all I, I even like to this day telling this story, like it, it's still that, that feeling is still with me. Uh, and we could get into this if you want, but you know, I've, I've worked with a lot of people over the years. And I've only ever encountered one other person that was like that in my career. Um, and I, it's something I've tried to emulate a lot. It, it's very hard to do. And I, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole of, you know, leadership styles uh, unless you want to. But Well, I'm um, actually curious, um, the, you know, 
I haven't been exposed to this industry for 20 years and I'm sure some have, some won't who listen to this show. So my understanding from talking to a lot of people is back in the day, the GM could yell at you and get away with it. Like literally just, that was just how it was because they're the GM and it was just very much that way. Do you agree? Like, cause you know, that leadership that you experienced was great, but without context, was he one of the same? Like, give us a little context to, yeah. to that. No, that, that he wasn't that way at all. Uh, he wasn't that way at all, but he, you're a hundred percent right. That was, that was the style. I mean, back then, uh, it was, you know, martini lunches and, and, uh, you know, you're like the mayor of a town, uh, kind of coming through, you, you breeze through, shake hands, uh, say hi to a few people, uh, and then you're sort of gone. You don't, you, you never really stood and interacted with the frontline staff. Uh, and I'm sure that there's some GMs that now that were GMs back then that would disagree with me that that's not how things were, but you know, that's <laughs> how things were perceived, uh, by the front line, uh, which, you know, perception, you know, perception, reality, you can make that argument. Um, Agreed. and I think that that style is still, it's still there today. Not, not the breeze through it. Well, actually, yes, not interacting with your front line stuff a hundred percent, but every industry deals with that. Um, but that command and control and do what I say, because I'm in the position that I'm in, that's still very much alive in our industry. Uh, those habits, those ways of, of being and interacting with people. If you've been doing it that way for so long, that's the only way you know how to do things. It's very hard to break that mold. And, uh, you know, I see as we come out of this pandemic, a lot of the discussions we have, you and I have a lot, I mean, we spend a lot of time on clubhouse, um, and, and there's a lot of discussion about this. And I talk with some other podcasters about it that, if we want to see change in the industry, if we want to get rid of that command and control and truly embrace what servant leadership means and truly embrace the cultural work culture changes in the industry that we absolutely need to see, it's got to come from conversations like this and people sort of really demanding and, and demonstrating the change that they want to see because it's never going to happen from the top down. It's got to happen sort of mid-level and below groundswell up. You have to demonstrate the change that you want to see. Otherwise, people don't know what it is you want. I think you're absolutely right. And because the one thing that <laughs> I've noticed, and if you've seen otherwise, let me know, but the people having the conversations like we're having are typically the people who feel like something needs to change and that there needs to be something done. The barking orders command and control GMs. I don't see them on any podcast. I don't see them, uh, you know, talking and interacting and engaging in the community. I don't see them on clubhouse, whatever. And like the argument can be made that, well, maybe they're just a little bit older in age, but that's just not a good argument to make because mm -hmm. there's people of all ages everywhere doing all different sorts of kind of things. And well, I think that there's a certain level of like, you know, you, again, just like they command and control and they just kind of expect that everybody's going to do as they say, because they're the GM or because they're the vice president or whatever, mm -hmm. that they don't need to do anything. They don't need to make any connections. They don't need to interact with other people and, and share their philosophies because it doesn't matter because they are who they are and they're better than everybody else. You know, it's, at least that's how they perceive it. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, you bring up an interesting point. Uh, and I, I have to do a little self-reflection on this just as a thought experiment because of what you're bringing up. Like if I, so I started my company in the podcast at the start of the pandemic because I had a corporate job with a hotel company and that job was eliminated because of the pandemic, along with many other people in the organization. And we are, we all know the stories about countless people in hotels that, it, you know, from line level all the way up to senior leadership roles and major Hotel companies lost their jobs and are still out of work. Um, would I be as active in these conversations now if I still had my old job? I, I mean, I don't know. It's it's hard to say. Uh, I it, I wouldn't necessarily have a vested interest in wanting to see the change that I know needs to happen in the industry because. 
if I still had my job, maybe I was, I was still successful. You know, I was still able to, to ride out this pandemic and, and there was no, I, there was no personal effect to me. You know, I was still able to, to get a paycheck every two weeks. And I think, and I, I mean, I don't know, you could ask me the, that question and I might give you a different answer depending on the day. But, you know, personal, personal experience is such a strong uh, motivator in wanting to kind of explain out or, or wanting to try to find alignment with other people who have gone through the same things that you've gone through, but also try to, to change the things that that maybe aren't right selfishly because they affected you, but also if you can find alignment with other people that have gone through the same things, you know that there's sort of commonality in negative experiences, then maybe there truly is something that needs to change. And, you know, I, and I say that on one side of the coin and on the other side of the coin, you know, up until the pandemic, you know, I'd had been arguably relatively successful, sort of climbing the ladder and getting into more senior roles all the way through my career. But that came at a cost. And that cost was the breakdown of personal relationships, uh, my health, uh, and not you know missing key events and, and not being able to go to friends' weddings. And, and like there was a lot of personal life goals put on hold and not being able to go on vacations and having literally having to cancel vacations uh, the day that we're supposed to go away somewhere because some, somebody's coming into the hotel and I have to be there. And, and this is as you're at what level do you really see this start to change for you where you see your relationships starting to break down? What, at what point in your career? Oh, department head. From Okay, so from department head forward, and just to be clear, right, you spent many years as a general manager and then most recently as a VP of ops for mm-hmm. a region. So mm-hmm. department head was probably what, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years ago for you? Uh, it would, my first de- true department head job was in, uh, 2003, um, no 2004. Cause I was, I would have been an assistant manager in 03. So 2004, uh, in San Francisco would have been my first department head job. Yeah. And that was the, fr- and the Fairmont San Francisco was an animal. I mean, that place man, it goes, uh, I love amazing. It's pretty cool though. Honestly, that, I mean, I actually want to stay there sometime. I hear they, the American concierge was kind of invented, if you will, at that Tom Wolf. Oh yeah. Tom Wolf. I know him very well. Uh, I mean, yeah, that, I mean, it was one of my favorite hotels and, and, and best jobs I've had to date. Uh, but that place was a beast. Uh, and that was the first time as, as director of front office, uh, that, that I realized, uh, that the job was going to demand a, a lot. Like I wasn't going to be able to have uh, a hand in all of the buckets of my life. That was, I was going to have to, if I wanted to be successful, put everything into the job. Uh, and what, the, what ultimately ended up happening is that I slowly started pulling away from a lot of other things in my life. And, uh, and, and, and that continued to happen for many, many, many years up and including like health and taking care of yourself. Um, and, uh, yeah, that ultimately probably came to a head sometime around 2015 or 2016, um, where I'm pretty sure I went into full burnout mode, full 100% burnout, um, had a medical scare went through a divorce um, and hadn't really gone home to see my family or, you know, uh, or maintained relationships with fam- my family and, and friends for a long time and, and, and kind of had to start over again and recultivate a lot of those relationships. And I, I look back on like, did I do the right thing by putting all my energy into my career. And I don't, I don't know that it was worth it looking back on it. I don't know that I'm past the burnout yet. 
that happened back then. I don't even know if that ever leaves you. If you redline so much for so long, can you ever come back from it? Or does, does, do the consequences of those actions forever alter your perception of how you interact with your work life? That can you, can you ever come back? I, I don't know. I'm still experiencing that personally. Uh, but you were a high profile GM, right? With Fairmont, you were a VP, like you had it made, right? That's what, that's what we're supposed to think, right? Yeah. But it doesn't come easy. It, I mean, you know, I, my, it, it takes, uh, if you want to get to that level, you have to put 100% of yourself into the job. And that's, that means like first in last out, you gotta, you know, you're volunteering for every committee, you're involved in every initiative, you're developing people underneath you, you're bringing new ideas to the forefront, you're running projects and executing on things, you're achieving outstanding results, not just financially, but with like different rating agencies and uh, they may be coming in AAA, Forbes, LQA, LRA, what, all these, you know, there's a million of them. Uh, now you got like, you know, TripAdvisor and all that in play, uh, employee opinion surveys, like there are so, 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 so many things. And now, I mean, and, and then speak about that, the higher up you get, when you get into like uh, you know, division head or director of ops GM, there's probably uh, an owner of your hotel that you have to interact with. And so now you're, you're dealing with a whole other group of stakeholders and, and their, their uh, desired results and performance for the property that they own. Plus you're kind of managing your brands and, and, you know, the people at, at that side of things, like it mushrooms so quickly that you can't not be a hundred percent involved all the time. But if you're giving a hundred percent to work, you're, you're not putting effort into the things that arguably matter more. And so, you know, I have the benefit of sitting here now saying, uh, yes, I achieved incredible things in my career, but they came at a cost. And it's easy to look at someone and say, oh, you did all these things and you, you achieved all this greatness. Um, and, uh, but, but you, if there's the, the personal cost on the back end to the person who's achieved those great things can be incredibly high. And, um, I don't really know the point that I'm trying to make here, but I guess is that, is that you could achieve all those great things. But I would argue that it's better to be more uh, thoughtful and methodical in your process and be willing to uh, make sure that you're continually doing the things that give you energy in your life so that you can show up to work in your career uh, with as much as you're able to give it while not letting other things in your life fall to the side. Do you know now in retrospect, why you gave it so much, why you let everything else fall by the wayside? Like, do you have a reason? Did you really enjoy it? Like, or was it just because you just got caught up in the, you know, when, oh, well, you know, if I leave before, my, you know, director of rooms, then that's going to look bad. So I'm going to stay later. And if I do this, then that's going to look bad. Or mm -hmm. if I take vacation, then I'm going to look weak. So, and somebody else is going to get the praise and recognition for the work that they do when I'm not there. Like, was it something like that? Or was it, or was it more money or was it, I just love working in hotels. So I'm just going to give it my all. Like what, why, why? It's everything that you just said. It's all of those things. Um, you get addicted to the, to the rush of being in a busy hotel, especially in, you know, some of the, the big, these are marquee properties uh, where there's, you know, there's always something going on. There's always somebody staying there. Um, and yeah, the culture of like, like I said, at this, at the, the jump here, like first in last out um, you, you, it was, it's almost an unspoken expectation that you're, you're always there. You're always on, um, you're always busy. 
and you're always contributing. You're always positive. <laughs> you're never, you're not, ne- you never really have a down day. Uh, you don't rock the boat. You fall in line. You like that. It, all of that stuff is in your head. And then, uh, and then add on top of that, someone who's a little type a add on top of that, someone who's highly ambitious. Uh, and, and you start to just create this, like, it's just a recipe for, for overworking yourself. Yeah. Did you, I mean, just, I guess, be honest with yourself, be honest with us as a GM, as a VP, when you were in a direct position to influence some of that culture within your sphere of influence, do you think that you did anything or enough to make a difference for the young assistant front office manager or the, the director of front office or the assistant director of housekeeping? What do you think? Uh, I would like to think that I did, uh, at least, at least try to push in a different direction. Uh, here's the tricky thing is the higher up you get, the, the more important it is for your success that you're able to drive positive results through other people. Your, your success depends on getting work done through other people. So you want to make sure that that they're taken care of, that they have everything they need, that you have a great relationship with them, uh, that there's open lines of communication, and that you try to embody the things, the behaviors, and and the actions that you want to see in the people that report to you. That's critical. Uh, but the other side of that coin is that oftentimes in a senior role within an organization, you're dealing with, with organizational culture that you have, you, it's very, very hard to turn that tanker ship, even in a senior level position. And because there's all what you've always got a boss who may see things differently. Um, and so you end up in this position where you have to, you're sort of balancing, you're trying to thread the needle. You're trying to find uh, the ways that you can give your team the things that they need while not going too far adrift from what the organization finds acceptable. And I think where a lot of people get caught up in senior positions is that they don't they don't find the gray area there. They don't find the, the path to maneuver. They just, they just kind of put company policy and ways of working uh, on their shoulders and just say, no, this is how we do things. You better fall in line. And I found uh, that I was able to be a better manager of people when when I, I looked for the common ground between what the people needed and the way that the company accepted uh, work being done for lack of a better way of putting it. So even then there was still almost like, cause I think for a lot of people for that, for that assistant front office manager, right? The GM is kind of like the end all be all. They don't know what's going on with the ownership and the shareholders and the brands and all mm-hmm. that dichotomy. So, you know, they think GM, you're it. That's, everything is starting and ending with you. Um, But even at that point for you, was there still a little bit of like a, I don't know if fear is the right word, but just kind of like a um, submission that you felt like you had to kind of have even, even in that role to, Mm -hmm. to, so would, would you say fear a little bit? Like, cause it sounds like, you know, when we're talking now, it sounds like, there's so many things that you would have wanted to change about just the industry or the hotels and stuff like that. And are these all new thoughts or is this stuff that you've been thinking about, but it just, you didn't have the right environment because like you said, there's always a boss. There's always that culture, not to mention the organizational culture, but you're fighting the weight of, you know, 150 years of the hotel industry, industry standards of like, this is the way that it's always been. Um, 
it's kind of a Herculean effort if you think about it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it is. And I don't want this to seem negative or like, you know, we're never going to do it. I absolutely think that there's things that we can do that are going to make the industry better. Uh, starting with a lot of the things that we've been talking about today. Uh, it's, um, you know, looking back on it. Yeah. I think, I think that. uh, Again, if it goes, if you if you're ambitious and you want to achieve things in an industry and you want to be the best of the best, and especially if you're operating in the luxury segment within the industry, it's a very small group of hotels collectively, and everybody knows one another. So if you want to, because it's just there's not a lot of people that really work in a, in in that sphere. And so you kind of come across the same names a lot of the time and the same people, even though they might move brands or move companies, move hotels. Um, and so, yeah, you kind of like, you sort of at the same time, it's, it's tough because you fall in line a lot of the time and you, cause if you want to be successful, especially when you're earlier in your career, you're, you want to make sure that you're contributing to the larger goals that the property or the company have because you want to get noticed. So, so yeah, back then for sure, that was, it, it's, it's a very tough thing to balance. And I think that's why ultimately, you know, you, you end up throwing so much of yourself into your job because you're always trying to figure out like how to navigate these waters. Meanwhile, everything on the personal side of your life is probably getting neglected because you're just so involved and entrenched in what you're doing for a living. And I, I don't know if other industries are like this, but I feel like hospitality is kind of uniquely because of the nature of the businesses is sort of stands almost alone in, in, in this respect and the demands on people and, and how you, you have to be, you really have to be a hundred percent all in for the greater good <laughs> than looking out for yourself. Right. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure I don't just like you, I don't know anything else other than hospitality. Um, but coming from a biased point of view, yeah, I think we're pretty unique in that sense. I mean, just the fact that it's open 24, seven, 365, like that'll never I mean. change. And that's always going to be a constant battle that, that we're fighting, um, to, to, you know, and it's a labor oriented business. So people call off, you got to show up. Like it just, place got to keep running. Uh, and I can, you know, when you talk about some of those examples, then you start to talk about, well, will it ever really change? And I think it can, and I think it will by, by, you know, if, if you don't burn them out 75 hours a week, every other week, and then you have to work a, you know, a 60 hour week one time, because there was a call off or an emergency, we're good. I think, I'd be fine with that. You know, mm -hmm. Shit, I was fine with the 75 hour weeks when it had to be, you know, I guess maybe deep down it was disturbing, but it, if it has to happen, it has to happen. Um, but I think, right. Establishing a normalcy of culture, which is promoting uh, a calm environment for everybody to be rather than an anxiety inducing environment for everybody. I think that would make a, yeah. and of course we're talking about it, like it's just easier said than, or, you know, but Again, yeah. it's, it's possible to change. And what a great time during this reset of the hotel industry to start kind of making those changes. Now, speaking of which, hotel industry collapsed. You lost your job. Um, so you were at like a very peak point of success. Mm -hmm. And you lost that and this like hearing now kind of from your own mouth and your story you talk about you're so ambitious and this and this was that tough for you to be like I was one of the casualties of this it was me like I wasn't good enough to overcome the inevitable so to speak did yeah. that thought ever cross your mind 100 percent. and you know five days before getting laid off we we were told that we were good until august and then like five days later, I got laid off. Yeah. So um, you, you had like this expectation almost that you were pretty much untouchable for the foreseeable future. I, I wouldn't say it in those words. Um, 
but yeah, I would say that uh, based on the, there was definitely some um, anxiety going on with me, with everything. Cause I, on one hand, like I was thinking like, I don't know how we're going to get through this. Um, like revenue just dropped off overnight. Like you can't, you got it. You got to do something. So we laid off a, a t- like hundreds of employees uh, at the hotels and you, and then, you know, we, and then the, the, the layoffs started happening at the home office. Um, so I, I thought something could happen, but once that, this is what's so critical for people when they're in positions of, of leadership, you have to be so careful in what you say. And if you don't know the answer, you say, I don't know. And, or, and I'll find out, but don't, don't make stuff up and don't, don't set an expectation that is unrealistic for people. And a lot of the anxiety that I had about what was going on in the early days of the pandemic, quite frankly, was alleviated by the conversation that we had had five days earlier saying that people, everybody at the home office were, we were initially thought we were good until May. And we figured, you know, after some changes that were made that we were going to be good until August. And I remember sitting in that meeting going weird. Okay. But I'll take that at face value for, because why would this person be saying that if it wasn't true? And then five days later, rug gets pulled out from, from under, uh, I don't know how many people that day got laid off at the home office, but, um, you know, at that point I didn't care cause it was just affecting me personally. Right. And, um, yeah, and it's absolutely colored my perception on leadership communication with the field and it's colored my perception on whether uh, on the security of the day-to-day W2 job and that, you know, the, the paycheck every two weeks and the kind of the false sense of security that comes around that. And it's colored my perception on being an entrepreneur and being in charge of the, the effort that I put in is, uh, or, or I should say the outcome that happens is a direct result of the effort that I put in. And because right. I'm in like control the- of, yeah, I'm in control of, of what happens to me. My the ability to pay my rent and put food on the table is not subject to the whims of somebody else within an organization. And I might sound a little bit angry and bitter when I say that, because I mean, it, you know, would I be in the position I am right now if, if the pandemic didn't happen? Probably not. I'd probably still be there and, you know, things would be moving forward. But it's just funny how you have these experiences that sort of sort of knock you back into like looking at things in a completely different way. And um, it, yeah, so it's been, it's been an interesting year. Yeah. Cause um, and like, I just, I just relate to you heavily. Cause it's like your merit didn't, couldn't save you. doesn't matter how good you were. You weren't good enough. It wouldn't never saved you. Um, the sacrifice that you made over your entire career uh, at the expense of your family, at the expense of your marriage, at the expense of your relationships, et cetera, didn't matter. Those sacrifices were gone. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of just like, I think just humbling to the utmost to just be like you, your contributions don't matter. They never did because now the guests aren't here and everything you've ever known is basically just not, not there anymore. Mm-hmm. And I know that sounds really, really bad, but I kind of feel like that's kind of exactly what happened. Um, yeah, it, I mean, it is, I mean, to put it bluntly, you're hundred percent right. Uh, and that's why my focus has shifted so heavily, shifted so heavily to, to content production and the podcast and connecting, you know, with you and people like you that do what you do is trying to try to figure out how to take all of this experience in the industry and, and, and tease out little bits of valuable lessons that might be relatable to other people out there that are either going through the same thing or they're early in their career trying to figure out what am I going to do? Or did I make the right choice when I went to whatever hotel school and graduated in May of 2020? Right. 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 What am I going to do now? So despite everything, despite even just before the pandemic, right? I mean, the hotel industry has been good to you, but it's also been very 
very nasty to you it seems like as well like you've really it's been such a uh it's it's i had an i've had an emotional reaction to your story because of that dichotomy you know that uh it's it's been tender and loving to you in the sense that it provided you with a now false sense of stability security and and you know and granted you did achieve uh, great success you know I guess but it was also at the end of the day based on the opinions of somebody else who was gatekeeping whether or not you were worthy of proceeding to the next level um, you know so it's been good to you in a lot of ways but at the same time it's deteriorated a lot of your different things across your life and now it's put you in a position that you weren't expecting but you still love it you're still now you're actually making the choice individually not because you're receiving a paycheck every two weeks to, to participate um, without coercion, if you will, in the hospitality and hotel industry. So why are you doing this? Don't you just want to give up and shut down and say, screw this? Go, go work for Amazon or Google or. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Why, why aren't you, why aren't you doing that? What are you still doing here? Yeah, I think this, it's a great question. And, and, you know, the only answer I can give you is that it gets in your blood. And, and in spite of, there's two ways that you can, well, you know, that you can look at, there's two sides of this industry. There's the hotel business and there's the business of hotels. And the higher up you go, you get more entrenched in the business of hotels and you start even though you have to have an eye on taking care of people and, and um, uh, the hotel business and the things that you kind of think about with that, uh, you, you, you start to shift your focus a little bit. And now I'm able to spend more time doing the things that put smiles on people's faces, that help people have great experiences, that, that um, you know, and that, and that kind of give me energy and, and that's returning or turning my focus more towards the hotel business, the hospitality side of things. And that's, you know, I, and I, I say that as being the founder of a, a new hotel management company and someone who's actively exploring and getting into vacation rental management. Yeah, because I, I see that as a major step forward in the industry. I think that, you know there, that's where a lot of focus is going to be on vacation rentals. Um, but I want to build this company with a different focus. I think that if you take care of the people, whether it's the guests or the employees, the money will follow. It will absolutely happen, but you have to have a focus on making sure that everybody has what they need it either, either to have a great experience or so that they can do their jobs properly so that they can provide great experiences for people. And guests have shown time and time again that they're willing to pay for great things. And if you can build that great thing, they'll pay for it and the money will come. Yeah. So that's been, that's now my new focus. Yeah. And uh, I think what you've just described is focusing and appreciating the long-term prosperity that comes when you build something real and you do it for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. It may not happen overnight, but it will come because people gravitate to things that are real and things that are genuine, things that are authentic and things that are right, just moral, et cetera. What the hotel industry has historically done is just chase month after month, week after week, trudging through the just malaise of short-term goals and objectives of, did we get our labor POR this month? Mm -hmm. oh, did we, well, what's like, it's just, it's exhausting. It's anxiety inducing and that's the burnout. But when you do something right and you just build it and nurture it over time, you don't have people, you know, anxious and upset. It's just a calm environment where, mm -hmm we're good because and even if you have a bad month, we're still good. We're still going. It's long-term baby. We're good. Exactly. And that's what it is. And, you know, I think another thing that I love that you said was the hotel business versus the business of hotels with 
hospitality MD, we say in, inspired by, uh, you know, Craig Poole, another uh, hotelier that we interact with, people who work on the business of hospitality and those who work in the business of hospitality. Mm -hmm. Those who work on the business are just doing it as a real estate investment. And it's just for no good reason other than to make money and just to feel like you're a hot shot. For those who work in the business of hospitality are just deep in it for the love of being a servant to others, for serving the community and just making the world a better place. And I think we know now that people just care, people care, consumers care, employees care about being with a company that actually has a reason for existing and actually has something to stand for. Um, but actually in a genuine way, because I mean, I think we've all seen a lot of pandering and bending over backwards for in, in an ungenuine fashion over the last year to try and give the perception that your company cares about things when it really doesn't. Um, again, short term gains, but those of us who really do care, I think are going to come out on top in the long term. So with that being said, just tell me a little bit, I know you kind of briefly introduced, but I want to give you, as we approach the end of the hour, just knowing hospitality, tell me a little bit about that. Um, and tell me about the Proven Principles podcast a little bit uh, as we kind of wrap up here. Yeah. Yeah. Happy to. So, uh, so the the management company that I started last year is called Knowing Hospitality. It's a, we're, we're a management, hotel management company. So if you own a hotel and, but you don't want to run it yourself for whatever reason, you don't have the bandwidth capabilities, or you're just tired of doing it on your own, you would hire a third party management company to run that hotel for you. And that's the way most of the industry is structured is that somebody owns a hotel and somebody else runs it. Um, so I started the company last year to, to help primarily independent hotel owners, uh, with exactly what I just, what I just, um, explained is running the hotel for them for a variety of reasons why they would hire somebody to a professional hotel manager to do it for them. Um, we've structured our management contracts differently. It's not a traditional hotel management agreement. We base our fees, our management fees, uh, off of the incremental profit that we drive in the property, not based off of revenue, like basically every management agreement is. Right. And the reason that we did that is that it creates a, a far stronger partnership between the management company and the ownership group. You know, you can, you can drive a lot of revenue to a hotel, but if you lose all of the revenue in the middle of the statement because you're mismanaging the expenses, the owner's the one that gets hurt, usually not the management company. And yes, I mean, you want to get into detail. Sure, there's performance clauses and all that, whatever. The point is, is that typical management agreements are based off of the total revenue that comes into a hotel. We base ours off of the incremental profit that we drive. So it forces us to be more entrepreneurial. Uh, it forces us to be more creative with how we run the operation. And, and the, the owner of the hotel benefits far greater because of the focus on making sure that those things line up and they uh, ideally put more money in their pocket, but we also win uh, as well. So that's, that's the philosophy. Right. And I, I just want to kind of, for those who may be listening, who aren't familiar with the that kind of structure of, of third-party management agreements. Um, and Adam, please correct me if I'm wrong, but right, your traditional one is going to probably be two or 3% of, of revenue as kind of a base fee. And then you might get an incentive fee based on GOP or something along mm -hmm. those lines um, after the fact. But I think what that does is that kind of leads to that short-term uh, sprint that, that, that we've been discussing, right? Because you can get a whole lot of revenue into the hotel, but if it bastardizes relationships, it just, it hurts the community. You're not managing the hotel properly. It really doesn't matter. So what you're doing is essentially saying, we're going to take the risk with you and we're going to take the profit. So say the hotel didn't profit anything. Are you saying that knowing hospitality wouldn't make money? Is that how that would go? I'm just but, want to be clear. Well, I mean, to put it simply, yeah, effectively, yes. Uh, now, 
you know, there's a stabilization period and, and we'll have right. a, we have a flat management fee and then we build in the, you know, not to get into, you know, a lot of detail, but to, you know, answer your question, there's, there's a, there's a small flat management fee that covers costs. And then, and then the rest of the management fee comes off of the the profit or the, it's not a profit share, but like, you know, for simplicity sake, call it a profit mm-hmm. share. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, we, if we don't do our jobs, then we don't make money. And why should we make money off of the backs of the owner if they're not making money? It's- I love that level of accountability because what we're seeing right now during the pandemic is because there's no revenue, the hotel management companies are getting pissed because they're not getting paid really and they're still working. Um, and they don't care about perpetuating and moving forward. They're just kind of paralyzed and just given up and just fearful Meanwhile, the owners are looking to them for solutions because they don't know how to run a hotel. They're just a real estate investor, essentially, but they don't care because they're not making any money. So if you reverse the script and the owners and managers are on the same side of the equation, uh, it's almost like a collaborative effort rather than a, um, you know, clashing like we've seen so commonly. Exactly. That's exactly I think that's right. genius, Adam. That's the, genius. Thank you. And that's that's the space that, you know, the, that's the benefit of having 25 years of working for management companies and seeing where the need is in the industry. You know, I'm not, not to say that we wouldn't love to run a 400 room hotel at some point, but, uh, you know, I th- the focus right now is, is smaller independent owners. Um, and they could be franchised hotels, but, you know, oftentimes they're not. It's just... Uh, uh, you know, uh, an owner who, who wants to explore opportunities to get more out of their asset. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like it would be a win-win for everybody involved. That's the hope. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's the hope. Otherwise my entire business model is, <laughs> doesn't work. <laughs> um, and then, so that, so that's the hotel company, uh, the management company. And in that we do a lot of hospitality consulting, uh, project work for uh, for different companies out there. So we've got about half a dozen projects on the go right now uh, for different hotel companies. And oddly enough, a lot of uh, tech companies reach out to help help them work in the hospitality space. Um, it, you know, so whether it's navigating room distribution or you know wh- how does food and beverage truly work behind the scenes. Uh, you know, how does staffing work behind the scenes in the hospitality space? So there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on on the tech side. Um, so we do that. Uh, and then a completely sort of side hustle is the podcast, uh, the, the Proven Principles podcast. And that actually, funny enough, I started that f- about almost three years ago. And my employer at the time didn't like the content product, didn't like the effort I was putting into producing something that was outside of the job. So I stopped. Oh, you don't say that's yeah, I know. I know. And uh, so I stopped it and then picked it up again in March of last year. Uh, I didn't necessarily rebrand it, but I just sort of figured out the direction I wanted to go with the show and, uh, and yeah, relaunched that. So we're coming up on about a year now. Uh, I just released episode 39. Uh, what's today, Thursday. So yesterday episode 39 came out. So we're, you know, we're getting some content. up there. Thank you. Uh, and, and I put, that's like turned into this whole other like passion that I didn't even know I had is this content production, talking to people like yourself in the industry and, uh, and just trying to not, not, not just have a seat at the table, but like push the conversation forward, whatever that is. That's re- I really believe that that's the key is, um, you know, you can be really good at managing a hotel but there's a lot of really good hotel managers who nobody knows who they are they don't have any legacy they'll it's just it's nothing but when you really start to again participate be at the table but not just be but push the conversation forward you start to build your legacy um and you start to build your your brand and i think that's important Mm -hmm. i really do Um, yeah thank you well adam this was a great conversation. I don't know about you. I really enjoyed it. It's uh, a lot so, of fun. Yeah, yeah. I, I thank you for your your vulnerability uh, throughout our conversation. Um, I, I definitely think a lot of people are going to listen to this and say, damn, 
here I am, you know, at what cost am I, what is my cost? Right. And I, and I think that's kind of the question, not saying where I don't think either of us are advocating for you to go and quit your, your job right now. We're not saying that, but just reevaluate, self-reflect, be aware of how you're feeling. Don't repress these things because it'll only come back stronger to bite you at the end. I want to make sure that if I can kind of give one last message, please uh, do wrapping yeah. here. I don't want anything that we talked about on the show today to come across as negative. It's my personal experience. The other side that we didn't talk about is that I've had the chance to live and work in world-class hotels, in world-class cities, in places that people around the world dream of visiting one time in their life. And that goes anywhere from Canada through the US and the Caribbean. Unbelievable journey that I've had. And I, I wouldn't trade that. It's got me to where I am today. This is such a great industry to be able to see the world and get paid to visit other com- countries and, and participate in other cultures and learn so much more about the world than just about any other industry in the world. There's, there's a million positives to this. And so if you're just trying to figure out whether or not you want to do this for a living, I would say expand your horizons a little bit and take advantage of the opportunities to see the world and get out there and just become a better version of yourself through interacting with other people. That's, that's the beauty of what it is that we do. Really, really nice way to say it there. And I also agree, like conversation meant to be productive in, in just talking about the reality that can be, but like we discussed, Adam is still in the hotel industry for a reason. He's not, he's choosing it now. This is his choice. Just like it is my choice. You know, this industry is, is vibrant. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It is life changing. There's, and you won't know until you do it. So I'll advocate for this industry, no matter what, I don't care how many times I get, I may be burned or along the way, it gets in your blood and it's, 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 uh, I'll ride or die for the hotel industry as I did, as you would as well. <laughs> love it. Love it. <laughs> Thanks for being on hospitality MD, Adam. Appreciate it. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you everyone so much for tuning in to this week's episode of hospitality MD. Remember we go live here every Friday at 11 AM central time. So tune in here, LinkedIn or Facebook to catch those live streams. If you haven't already subscribe to our channel, And remember, connect with Adam on LinkedIn, follow Proven Principles podcast, and learn more about knowing hospitality via the links in the description. We'll see you next week for another interview. Have a hospitable day, guys. We love you.